Well, do you know what Lugal Ani means? I do, and here's why. Cheers. Welcome back everybody to me talking about books, and not just any books, but today we'll be talking about Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson, as sort of a preamble to me talking about Scissors Cut Paper Wrap Stone by Ian MacDonald, which will happen in the next couple of days. Anyway, this one's a classic. Um, it's been out for like 40, no, 30 years now. I'm getting confused with numbers already. Um, I'll do the usual thing. I'll give you a synopsis why you should read it, and uh, then um, I'll have a sip of beer, and then we'll talk about spoiler-ish things that I feel are important for this book, and may give some context for that Ian MacDonald book that we'll talk about very soon. Also, you know, it's a classic. It's worth talking about in general. So, let's just, you know, do that, right? All right, Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson is one of the most um, important, impactful, and so forth um, science fiction novels of the last 30 years. Um, I'll just say that without any further ado. It's a classic, it's what you might call maybe still cyberpunk or post-cyberpunk, it's certainly on that cusp stylistically. Um, it's set in the, well, probably around now, maybe more like 10 years ago or whatever. Um, it hasn't obviously happened, the kind of future that uh, Neil Stevenson is describing there. It's set mostly in California. It follows two main um, point of view characters. One of those is called Hero Protagonist, um, and he's, um, uh, well, the world's greatest sword fighter, uh, sword fighter and freelance hacker, and sometimes pizza delivery driver. And the other one is YT, who's a teenage girl um, a skateboard courier. And uh, they are sort of drawn into um, some really large machinations between different um, media moguls, um, uh, organized crime, what you might call organized crime and so forth, and a lot of um, weird shit about linguistics and Sumerian language, um, which is um, interesting. It's a very fast-paced story that does have some major big info drums in the middle, and it goes weird places, it um, has a very fast-paced, not fully what you might call um, a stream-of-consciousness style of writing, but it's very specific, idiosyncratic style of writing. It's, yeah, it's an action-packed book that um, is very 80s and 90s in that regard. Once again, I really enjoyed this book. I have, I love this book. Uh, it's a very problematic love, and we'll get to why that is um, in the spoiler-ish part. I think it's if you're if you're into science fiction, this is a book you need to read. It's next to Neuromancer, probably the most important um, cyberpunk-ish novel out there. Um, if you're you know, interested in why the world is fucked the way it is right now, especially when it comes to say Silicon Valley um, tech corporations, tech people doing weird shit and stuff like that. This is once again a book you need to read. It is beyond, you know, whether you really love it or not, this is one of the key texts that explain why the 2000s are the 2000s in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, I mean, go read it already, right? It's, it's not that long, it's fast-paced, and um, it will definitely give you a larger understanding of um, science fiction as a genre, of, um, well, parts of the tech industry and um, digital culture in a lot of ways, and um, yeah, you may even enjoy it, because it can be really enjoyable if you're, you know, if you're okay with irony, I guess, is the, the key point here. And uh, yeah, once again, no star ratings, because I don't do those, but yeah, it's definitely one of the most important books um, when it comes to genre fiction of the last 30 years, which may be a good thing or a bad thing. So yeah, go read it already, I'll have some beer, and then we'll talk about all the things that um, I feel are important, or at least the stuff that I can remember and spew out before my camera overheats. <laughs> Those are not necessarily the same thing. All right, let's start with the first part here. This is what I would call um, spoilerish, but not yet fully spoilerish, and that's uh, what I would call nerd sci-fi um, uh, in general, and one of the first parts here is inspiration. Now, Neil Stevenson is one of these authors that does very specifically what I would call nerd sci-fi in that regard. I think it's um, important to understand what I mean by that, and that is a certain kind of author that um, is heavily plugged into um, watching the news, looking at tech development, but also like in cultural developments and so forth. <laughs> William Gibson is 
a similar author in that regard. His interests just run in like very different uh, ways from Neil Stevenson's. But it's the kind of author that reads a lot of stuff and then gets incredibly excited about whatever thing they have just discovered and decide to write a book about that specific thing. And that's not a bad thing, right? It's like, it's how a lot of us work in a lot of ways. We we read something, we're like, wow, this is really cool. I got to tell everyone about it. Um, and that, I think, is what I why I call it nerd sci-fi in a specific way. Now, Snow Crash has a number of these elements. And I want to start with that. One of the key inspirations for this book, I feel, and it's one of those nonfiction books that I think might be worth talking about in detail later on at some point, either as a larger video on um, nonsense, um, uh, nonsense academia texts that are highly influential or specifically just this book. And that is, of course, Julian Jaynes's The Origins of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, which has possibly inspired more or influenced more science fiction books than anything else than, you know, maybe James Fraser's The Golden Bough, um, obviously The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and possibly The White Goddess. It's this powerful. And um, it's, it's, it's a non-fiction book about the idea that back in the olden days, our brains did work differently. We didn't have what you might call self-consciousness and how that came about later on. It's definitely one of the key things where the whole idea of, you know, a Sumerian Ur language that is different and um, acts on like um, deep uh, structures in the brain kind of comes from that is such a deep, uh, such a key part of, of course, um, Snow Crash's idea, and it definitely inspired a lot of science fiction authors. Philip K. Dick, Stephen Erickson has mentioned it, um, well, Neil Stevenson obviously has mentioned it, there's a um, Rob Robert Sawyer novel about it. If you look at the list of <laughs> authors that have, sp have been inspired by this specific book, it's long. Uh, so it may be worth talking about it in some detail at a different place. Then there is, of course, the early days of a connected internet. This is like the early 90s. We have Usenet, we have people actually talking about, you know, to each other on the internet. So that is another exciting thing. And Neil Stevenson has certainly written about his experiences um, as an early adopter of computer technology um, and how that has, you know, definitely shaped his uh, approach to writing and uh, the worlds he talks about. That is the second big thing that is kind of tied into that. And then, of course, there is Sumerian mythology and Sumerian stuff. There's like one book that gets quoted a lot in this um, in, in Snow Crash. That is, of course, Enki Myths of the Crafty God, which does exist. Um, my university has two copies and I've been um, tempted to um, take uh, to borrow, borrow one and read it uh, for like, I don't know, 20 years by now. <laughs> I haven't done so yet, but clearly this is this is where we can see sort of like the building blocks. Neil Stevenson reading something about Sumerian mythology and language going like, wow, this is cool. Reading Julian Jaynes going like, wow, this is really cool. And he's right about both of those two things. And then also being sort of plugged into early internet culture or the, the beginnings of um, um, digital communication on stuff like Usenet and the, the early internet um, in a way. Those are the building blocks. And the story is kind of tied around all of those things. This is what I would call um, the inspiration for nerd sci-fi. I think nothing nothing about this is bad, all right? Um, so let's just like put this down. I think it's interesting to see how a specific kind of um, science fiction is built that way. There are other authors that do similar things. And um, my argument here will be that this specific type of science fiction does... Um, reach a very specific audience that thinks in similar ways. And that, that is kind of what I want to build to here. The next part here is, uh, of course, um, nerd science fiction and its audience. As I said, this is very much um, driven in a lot of ways by the interests of the author in very specific cool technology. And that certainly does attract a very specific kind of audience. And this is where I really start talking about like why my love for um, Snow Crash is maybe a <laughs> highly problematic love, um, because I was attracted by this book immediately. And the interesting thing here, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, is it's a very specific kind of self-aware audience. This book was very, very influential in a lot of ways for, you know, the kind of people that wish they could be like hero protagonist. And in, in that, I mean, people that are relatively smart or relatively intelligent and highly educated with in the field of technology, in the field of digital technology, probably in, in most cases, they are specialists in that regard. They, they are, well, what 
Neil Stevenson calls um, hackers. This comes back uh, when we talk about, say, um, some of the characters in Cryptonomicon, and it's, it's certainly a character type that has co- gone through most of um, Stevenson's novels over the years, and um, there's a lot of people out there that kind of think of themselves as being this kind of class. People that are, that have a technological or an educational advantage uh, towards other people, especially during the 90s and early 2000s when digital technology was not as ubiquitous as it is now. And it certainly made us feel superior to other people because we could, you know, use computers and, and they couldn't. Um, once again, this has obviously changed, um, but this is very specifically the kind of audience. People that are aware that they are uh, have an educational advantage, they mistakenly sometimes think that they also have like uh, other advantages or are superior because education and intelligence are often conflated and um, that can go down really dark roads um, and that's kind of where we are building to with this over time. There is of course and, and I think this is important here also the idea that these this kind of audience is sort of aware of the problems of the world, right? Hero protagonist is um, half Asian, half black, so he's not a white guy. People are sort of aware of um, ideas like sexism, racism, and so forth. They may still be very racist, sexist, and so forth um, in other ways, but they are aware of the different issues of the world. They just feel that they are, might be just above it because of their um, well superiority in very specific tech skills. That, I think, is one important part for this specific audience. They also have either read a lot of stuff and recognize a lot of pop culture references, or they are um, at least able to research that stuff quickly on, say, Wikipedia or other places and find out and get the jokes in this book. Snow Crash is highly ironic. It has a lot of really over-the-top comparisons, uh, similes. Um, it has a lot of pop culture references in in all kinds of ways that make it feel really at sort of like the pulse of the time, um, pushing the envelope, and um, you can feel smart when you get all those jokes. I mean, this is early 90s, and there's already a joke about Bart Simpson's t-shirts in there. So the, the, clearly, and this once again goes back to the fact that people like authors like Stevenson or William Gibson and so forth are usually very, very well aware of like so the current trends in both culture, pop culture and technology and build their novels out of that. So that's the kind of audience um, that I feel is drawn to that specific kind of book. And I certainly was probably still am that kind of audience, right? I studied computer science in the early 2000s. I read way too much. I got most of the jokes. Um, I even started, uh, took a course in a Sumerian language at university after reading this book. And when I found out that we actually have a course in Sumerian language at my university, so I went and uh, did that. Um, <clears throat> but the problem is that uh, with that feeling of superiority come a lot of other issues, which is kind of where we need to go next with this. And that is, of course, um, nerd science fiction and um, cynicism. All right, so let's let's move on to the next part. As I said, a lot of this is about being self-aware, sort of being sometimes self-deprecating, but in that weird way where you, why, while being self-deprecating, you kind of assert superiority, at least to yourself. And, uh, and this book does very much appeal to that kind of audience and does sort of like further that, both within the text and I feel to a lot of people that read it, if, you know, I, I certainly did not recognize the problems with that um, until like way later, and it kind of does that. And it does that through irony and cynicism. Don't worry, this will come back later. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, the world in Snow Crash is kind of shit. It's really shit. And now this is written in the early 90s. Um, obviously, um, uh, history has ended. Fukuyama has written his book. Uh, communism has collapsed. Socialism, well, at least the Soviet version of communism has collapsed. Um, capitalism, neoliberal capitalism is working. Um, it's clearly not going well. Um, and the book kind of gets that. But... Um, while describing clearly a dystopia, it kind of also does so in an over-the-top ironic way. This is, once again, this is like a very much a late 80s, early 90s kind of thing. There, You have sort of parallels to that in, you know, mo- movies like Demolition Man and, and stuff like that, right? Um, the idea of having all these um, burb claves, these different franchises that are quasi-nations, and th- all of those are very much um, caricatures in a lot of ways, which is, you know, why you have uh, Cosa Nostra Pizza, the mafia delivering pizza. Which is why you have um, New South Africa as a city, you know, a quasi-national national state of, of white supremacists. But you also have Colombia and all these other... It takes all these different elements of our world, 
and um, turns it up to 11, which can be incredibly cool and edgy when you're 15 and reading this for the first time, don't get me wrong. Um, there are certainly underlying issues with a lot of these stereotypes being obviously clearly stereotypes and um, the book's sort of hoping that everyone understands that these are stereotypes. The idea of a microaggression has clearly not been invented in like, uh, or not been, not reached all the way to Neil Stevenson in the early 90s. So a lot of the these elements can be seen as these kind of... Uh, and this, once again, uh, this um, microaggression and um, certainly uh, these uh, more harmful elements. And I think this, is, this once again ties back to this idea of the, the nerd science fiction audience thinking of itself as being smart. So you can read this book and go like, well, I'm aware of, you know, these being like racist stereotypes and clearly this is done for fun and so forth. But there comes a point where it's very easy to kind of fall off that sort of like um, tightrope of irony into a very dark place. And I think this is something that I feel is dangerous and which is where I want to go with this near the end. So clearly there is a level of irony in here that is far beyond anything else. And it's self-aware once again. There, there's jokes in there, like all these irony laden elements and then in like in the sense like this all of this is very postmodern so it's it's once again it's highly self-aware it, it take, takes irony and all the way to 11 i feel but, but case in point of course the, the the wonderful like office memo about toilet paper which is clearly incredibly funny and ridiculous in a lot of ways um and takes the idea of both like state um, policies and stuff like that and you know the way that our world usually works these days all the way uh, to like a very very funny but also ridiculous end the problem with irony is that it's sometimes indistinguishable from cynicism which is where i want to go with this next because i would argue that while snow crash and other books of its ilk and its audience are thinking they are ironic and use ironic distance to a lot of things it kind of flips at some point into cynicism which is where we need to talk about ideology um, because of course we need to and then we kind of hopefully end this soon see it does have an ideology and it also does not and this is kind of where we end up with the cynicism thing see Clearly, uh, communism is not uh, the end goal. You can see Snow Crash being very much a dystopia. Obviously, the world there doesn't work really well. Capitalism is fucked. We have hyperinflation. The United States have basically lost all kind of function that states usually have, which is, you know, a monopoly of power and stuff like that. All of that has happened. I am... Um, at some point, like, the trillion dollars uh, notes are called Mises, Mises, and I'm wondering, is that a, uh, a Chicago school a neoliberal um, libertarian joke or not? I'm not quite sure. If so, it's, it's funny. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but clearly, and this is, I think, the problem there is that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Clearly, there's pollution, there's sacrifice zones, the world is fucked in every way, shape, or form. But Snow Crash does not even think about the idea of what might be a way out of that. The plot is, of course, uh, stopping Elba Breith, who's kind of an L. Ron Hubbard, kind of other elements of that kind of guy, which is probably why he's, uh, you know, on, a, on, a, on his own flotilla out in the sea. Um, stopping him from, you know, doing mind control over everyone, which is fine. But after that, the world just continues to be, well this libertarian hellhole in a lot of ways and clearly the question is like is that what um we're supposed to think as well is inevitable so we have to live with it or is that uh, just that the book doesn't care it's kind of hard to understand and this is sort of where what i mean by ideology clearly this is what um, stevenson at the time thought might be one way our future might be headed and he might not be wrong still not be wrong the problem is that within this world this once again ties back to its audience the only thing, the only option you have is to get ahead in that system, make as much money by being superior, a superior human being, in this case, having the education and skills to work as a hacker or as a skater like YT and so forth. Having these to get enough money to sort of step up and build enough personal safety around you, which is what you might call anarcho-capitalism, which is bad. Don't get me wrong, this is really, really bad. And it's an ideology that only people who come at this with, you know, the, the, that feeling of superiority that I um, 
diagnosed part of the nerd science fiction audience with and have because otherwise you go like this is this is not the kind of place i would ever want to live in <laughs> but clearly p some people think think that and that's that's i feel where this book becomes postmodern it does not have any ideology it does show a terrible place where you are basically left to your own devices to maybe get ahead enough to survive and enjoy a good life it does not even ask the question how could we actually you know change the world or make it better and that is where I think irony flips from, you know, it flips into cynicism because it doesn't even care. It's like, well, clearly there's nothing we can do. The world is fucked. All we can do is um, do our best to get ahead personally. And um, yeah, I think that's one part that has not necessarily aged well in a lot of ways. When you look at current science fiction, clearly there's um, a more, um, uh, more concern with like how to change the world in there. And uh, yeah. Also, you know, when we look at the other side of what people who read this book in the beginning uh, of their careers, kind of where those went, yeah. <laughs> Which is obviously where we need to end with um, uh, nerd science fiction and Snow Crash and its impact on reality. Because while well, most people who read Snow Crash found it interesting and then just went on and became more or less well-adjusted human beings or fuck-ups like me, there are a few people who kind of took the wrong lessons, I would argue. And those are tech billionaires who are now in, well, all kinds of positions. If you've ever asked yourself why Facebook changed its name into Meta and started to build a metaverse, well, this is the book. Um, clearly, someone read Snow Crash in that regard very explicitly. If you ever asked yourself why people are using the term avatar for, you know, those pictures that represent ourselves in... Um, digital media. Well, this is the book to blame. There's a lot of people who read this book and decided that, yes, the world of Snow Crash is the world that is something we need to go towards. We need to accelerate to become, to end up in this world because they are confident that once we reach this world, they will be the ones in power. They will be the Ings of Ing security. They will be Mr. Lee of Gray, Mr. Lee's Greater Hong Kong. They will be Uncle Enzo of the Cosa Nostra Pizza and so forth. They will be the ones in charge which is interesting because clearly there is that second level of self-awareness built into the novel, but a lot of people kind of ignored that. And um, if you go now into, say, current politics and you look at people like Manchus Moldbuck, um, Curtis Jobin, um, who is sort of like the uh, the philosopher of choice for someone like Peter Thiel, if you look at J.D. Vance, who has been financed by Peter Thiel and is quoting Manchus Moldbuck and people like that, this is the dark side of Snow Crash. This is where people who read that book and felt that they want to be like hero protagonist and all these the cool people who have who think of themselves as superior enough to survive our planet going to absolute hell, who think that this is the natural order of things and are trying to make that world a reality, which is the dark side and the danger of a book like Snow Crash. It does leave all form of humanity, of solidarity and so forth behind. It hides behind a wall of irony, flipping into cynicism, and the lack of ideology makes it incredibly easy to be turned into or be um, adapted and recuperated by a very specific kind of um, ideology, and that being a very far-right version, authoritarian version of something that masquerades as libertarianism, but is in fact hardcore um, authoritarianism. And that's bad. And this is sort of where I feel I end this with me talking about how this my love for this book is certainly problematic because I love this book. I have all the potential to be one of these kind of people and I certainly could have ended up in that situation. I still love that book. I read it the last two days and I still have to smile until laugh and it's it's awesome. It's 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 written for people like me. I feel smart while reading this book. I feel cool while reading this book. I get it. It's really really fast. It's fun. It's brilliant. And then I step back and go like, well, but what have I learned from this? Become a freelance hacker and be better than everyone else so I can just like do whatever I want and let the rest of the world just go to hell? Is that what I want? I don't know. I personally don't want that. But I think it's, it's important to understand that this is the underlying thing where we have a very politically motivated cyberpunk of Neuromancer and so forth being lost behind in the early 90s after the end of the Cold War and being sort of taken over by full-on neoliberalism and the acceptance that this is where we are and that there's nothing we can do about it. I personally don't like that.
Anyway, this is where we end. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, if you have thoughts on Snow Crash, please tell me about them down in the comments. Um, if you want to support me, there's a Patreon. If you want to support me more, I don't know, subscribe, like, share this, uh, tell your friends about it. And if you want to know what Lugalani means, it's Sumerian and it means Great King and it's stamped in all those royal inscriptions on bricks and so forth when a king um, had to tell which building he built for which um, king, for which god and so forth. Um, that's all I remember from that course in Sumerian. With that bit of education, I'll leave you and uh, we'll talk about um, Scissors Cut Paper Wrap Stone next and let me know if you want me to talk about Julian James's um, book as well. And until then, thanks and cheers. <laughs>